Today we're going to continue our discussion on parallel RLC circuits, AC case. So let's start off with something relatively straightforward. We'll take a voltage source and just two components. We'll throw in a resistor and a capacitor. So for starters, the voltage source We'll say this is a one volt peak at a frequency of 10 kilohertz. And we'll use this as our reference angle. The voltage we'll assume is angle zero. 400 ohms for the resistor. And for the capacitor, we'll say that's 100 nanofarads. All right, so the first thing we have to do, of course, is find out what X of C is. So we have our equation for that. X of C is a negative J 1 over 2 pi FC. So we can plug our numbers in here. All right, we've got uh, 10 kilohertz and 100 nanofarads. And that's going to work out to... 159 ohms, right? Minus J on that, of course. All right. We might, there's a couple different approaches we might take here, but we're going to look at a couple different ways of, of attacking this and see if they agree, essentially. Uh, the one thing we might remember about parallel circuits in the DC case, which would also be true in the AC case, is that the voltage everywhere is the same, right? There are only two connecting nodes Everything is connected to that, so the voltage is consistent throughout a parallel connection. So we could immediately find the currents. Right? That's what we're going after here, obviously, since the voltage is the same. To find the currents, we could immediately use uh, Ohm's law on that. Another approach would be to grab the total impedance Z and then find the source current, and then we could do a current divider. So let's find out what Z is. Well, like in any parallel circuit, we can use uh, the reciprocal rule or we can use product sum rule. We only have two of them, so product sum rule would work out pretty well here. So we can say that Z would have to be 400 times the uh, negative J159. And then divided by the sum, right? 400 plus negative J159. I'm going to put that capacitive reactance in parentheses so that we don't have a problem with the minus sign. Right, so that doesn't look like 400 minus 159 over here. Okay, so when we work this through, we get an impedance out of this equal to 147.8. That's the magnitude at an angle of negative 68.3 degrees. Now that would make sense. You know, if you look at these values, obviously uh, the capacitive reactance dominates the pair, just like we would, when we would have two resistors. You know, if you had a 400 ohm resistor and a 159 ohm resistor, it's that smaller one that dominates. So that's what we see here. The angle is closer to minus 90 rather than zero. Right? So we would say the circuit is more heavily capacitive. Now, once we know this total Z, right, this whole thing looks like 147.8 at negative 68.3 degrees, we could find out what the source current is, right? What's this? What's IS? So we can just use Ohm's law on that, right? That's going to be uh, voltage divided by impedance. And we just said we're going to use this as our reference, 1 volt peak. Right? So it's going to be 1 at an angle of 0 divided by the impedance we just found. Of course, because we are talking about a peak voltage, obviously we have a peak value for the current. That works out to 6.77 mils for the magnitude. And obviously the angle is going to be 68.3 degrees positive. Okay, so that's our current. And as I said, we could do a current divider on this now to find the two pieces. But just to kind of, you know, 
look at this two different ways. Let's use Ohm's law to find the two branch currents, right? IR and IC. So IR, basically we're going to do the same sort of thing over here. Uh, voltage divided by the associated impedance, right? Resistance or reactance as the case may be. So everybody sees the volt. Take that divided by 400 ohms and we have IR, right? So that's just going to be uh, two and a half mils at an angle of zero, right? 400, 400, zero. Be real persnickety about that. And then the IC value, similar deal. Right? In this case, it's 159 at an angle of minus 90. You should get used to sort of freely going back and forth between saying that's minus J159 or 159 at an angle of minus 90, right? It's two ways of saying the same thing. It's six versus half a dozen. Um, but sometimes it's just more convenient to think of it in one form or another, like this. If we're going to do a divide, it's convenient to think of it in terms of uh, polar form. All right. Anyway, when we grind through that, we're going to get 6.29 mils, obviously at an angle of 90 degrees. Now, if we take these two, and we add them together. So here's our KCL, right? We take these two things and we add them together. All right, we should get the source current. Now, let's do a little phaser diagram on this just to see if it makes sense visually. All right, so here's our real axis, imaginary plus minus for our currents. Okay, so, you know, what do we... What do we have here for our currents? Um, let's start with the small one here. We've got IR at two and a half mils at an angle of zero. Um, the biggest one we have is 6.77, so that's you know not quite three times the size. So we might say IR looks something like this by scale. All right, this is the two and a half at zero. Okay, now. Uh, the corresponding capacitor current, 6.29 at 90, so that's straight up and down. And it's, um, you know, about two and a half times the size. So, quick sketch here. That's going to look something like this. All right, 6.29 mils at 90 degrees. Okay, now we were to plot the combination of those two. Right, that's going to look something like this. And we calculated 6.77 mils at an angle of 68.3 degrees. Well, does that seem right? Yeah, certainly it does, right? The length of that seems about right, a little longer than the blue. And the angle is clearly more than 45. So, you know, visually that seems to make sense. Okay? All right, so that's our phaser. All right, phaser representation, phaser diagram. Nice, compact way of doing it. Um, you know, a phaser diagram of the voltages would be really simplistic, right? I mean, everything is one at an angle of zero. So you don't get a nice picture. Right? In this case, current is the sort of set of variables. Again, it's like the flip in DC, you know, between series, right? In series, current everywhere is the same. It's the voltages that vary across the individual components. Here, voltage is the same. It's the currents that vary through the various components. Okay, anyway, let's take a look at the um, time domain response, right? If we were to get out an oscilloscope, what do we see? Okay, um, one thing to remember here, current and voltage in a resistor are always the same. If I'm going to use the voltage as my reference angle, then the current through this resistor will have the same exact angle. Okay? It has to. So, maybe I'll use that as the first thing I'm going to draw um, you know, at my 10 kilohertz. 
So just on an arbitrary scale here, maybe I'll say this is like, uh, you know, one full cycle. So there's half a cycle. Okay. And I'm going to have to leave room in here for the other high bits. So we have something like this. All right, so that amplitude is the two and a half mils, right? Now, um, in comparison to that, we could look at IC, All right? So that's at an angle of uh, plus 90 degrees. So this is leading by 90 degrees. And it is, of course, quite a bit taller. Um, but what I like to do is you know, get sort of like my zero crossings. I like to get my timing correct first. 90 degrees is an easy one. Right, you know, this is 360, there's 180, quarter cycle is 90 degrees. So here's my quarter cycle. So if it's ahead by that much, then this is where the positive going slope is, and that's where the negative going slope is. Now, all we have to do is figure out, you know, where is the peak? Well, at 90 degrees, the peak is right on this axis, and that's going to be sitting up at 6.29. So I'm just going to say, you know, if this is 2.5, I'm just going to say, 6.29 is up there somewhere, right? Likewise, it'll be, you know, down around here somewhere. So, sort of connect my little dots. Now we're going to get something that goes like that. There's my IC. But eight, okay, moving right along. Now, time to look at the combination of the two, right? IS. Well, it's going to be a little bit taller than the blue up here somewhere. Right, 6.77 versus 6.29. And it's going to be in between the two, uh, the, the two waveforms, but it's going to be closer to the blue, right? It's 68.3 versus 90 versus 0. So that's 0, that's 90. 68.3 is going to be, you know, like out here somewhere coming up. And then coming back um, down, you know, somewhere around here, the peak is going to be maybe, you know, about there, right? And same kind of deal over here. You know, peak is maybe over here. So again, got my little sort of sketch points. And I can, that needs to be a little bit more rounded off. But essentially something along that line. All right, that's my source current. That's what we're going to see on an oscilloscope. Okay, now, next question. What if we have an RLC circuit, right? In other words, I have the three components. How does that change? In other words, we have something like this. Well, similar sort of thing that we saw in the series case. You know, um, obviously we have a new path for current flow, but as far as the phasor diagram is going to be concerned, you know, again, they're all gonna have the same voltage, um, we're just going to see a 90 degree in the opposite direction for IL. In other words, quick sketch of the phaser. Okay, it's going to look something like this. Uh, let's, let's, I'll just say, you know, the, the R is out this way. I'll use the same colors. The C would be out like this, right? And let's try this green one. So the... Um, IL would be down here. And then, you know, depending on the precise magnitudes of these, you know, if IC is bigger, we're going to get an IS out here somewhere. If IL is bigger, we're going to get an IS down that way. All right. Always orthogonal. You're always going to see 90 degrees between these two. IC and IL are going to be exactly 180 degrees out of phase. Has to be the case, right? One leads compared to the resistor, the other lags compared to the resistor, both by 90. So you know, the combination uh, has to be out by um, 180 degrees. What else can we do to sort of mix this up a little bit? Well, what if we had a current source? You know, what if we had um, sort of a voltage source? You know, what if we have a current source out here? Whether I have two or three or you know, however many components, how does that change? How does our approach change? 
Well, you know, we can't just start right off and say, oh, I've got uh, a certain voltage over here, because I don't know what the voltage is. You, know, you have a couple of options. Knowing what IS is, right, knowing what the source current is, um, you could immediately do a current divider rule, right? Find these two currents. You could also do what we did up here, which is find the Z value, and then knowing Z, you could find the source voltage by just saying it's your source current times Z. All right, once I have that, I could do the same trick over here of taking that voltage and dividing by uh, the associated re uh, resistance and reactances. Okay? Okay. Um, you know, notice that the, the voltage angle here is going to equal your impedance angle. Right? If you take IS as the standard, if this is your reference, you say it's you know, 2 milliamps at an angle of 0 degrees, whatever the angle of Z is, that's what the angle of the source voltage is. So that's a useful thing to remember. Over here we see sort of a flip. Right? The impedance angle is a negative 68, and the current is at a positive 68 because we're taking the voltage as the reference. Right? But here we would be taking, typically, we would be taking the current as the reference, so we see that voltage sort of flip around. All right? Okay. Um, I think what we'll do here is uh, we'll take a look at a simulation so that we can get somewhat prettier uh, diagrams, all right, rather than our um, little sketches here. But this is a useful, a useful sketch, and like I said, you might want to try this on some graph papers so that you have some better... Uh, uh, spacings, you know, instead of just sort of randomly drawing it freehand, kind of like what I did here initially, drawing a, a cycle, a half cycle, a quarter cycle, and then you can get your ideas of, of where things are going, okay? You know, that might be useful. What do you say? All right, let's fly.